Thank you for joining us for this recorded web seminar from the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration's National Records Management Training Program. In this briefing, first presented in September 2012, Susan Means of NARA's General Records Schedules team covers a number of ways federal agencies can use GRS Chapter 20 to schedule electronic records and systems. Let's join the seminar. Good afternoon. My name is Kitty Carter, and I'm part of the tra National Training Team at the National Archives and Records Administration, and I will be hosting today's online briefing. These online briefings were created by NARA to present current records management subjects to a widely geographical dispersed audience. This series of online briefings will allow us to maximize our limited government resources. This briefing will last approximately one hour. This hour includes a presentation on a topic for approximately 30 minutes, and then we will open up for questions and answers. As your phones are on mute, please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions during the presentation and the question and answering session. Today's presentation is using GRS to schedule electronic records, and we have Susan Means, Senior Records Analyst from NARA Pacific Alaska Region. Susan is a chartered member of the General Record Schedule team. She has been with NARA for eight years. This session will answer questions on how to apply the GRS Disposition Authority for certain electronic records, electronic system, and related hard copy records. With that said, I would like to turn it over to Susan Means. So good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? So as Kitty said, my name is Susan Means, and I've been with NARA for about eight years, all of that time in Anchorage, Alaska. So I'm probably, I'm guessing I may be the, the person uh, furthest west on the line today, although we certainly might have some folks from Hawaii. That does happen. Um, but at any rate, I'm happy to get started with this uh, briefing on using GRS-20 to schedule electronic systems. Um, and look forward to entertaining some of your comments and questions from the chat uh, box towards the end of, uh, of our hour together. And so with that, remind me how to take control. So I wanted to um, begin with just a little bit of background information. So if you guys are on this webinar, you're already at least have some passing familiarity with GRS-20, and that passing familiarity probably has resulted in as much confusion as clarity. So we know that. Feedback, both anecdotal uh, over the years and then from a series of um, information gathering sessions that the GRS team did earlier this year, tells us that the GRS-20 is both confusing and out of date with many of the items uh, in GRS-20 dating from 1995 and earlier. And in the, the world of electronic records and electronic systems, that, that's several lifetimes. So clearly we know that something needs to be done to address um, improving GRS-20 and bringing it into uh, conformance or uh, into, into line with the way people uh, manage and have systems today and have records relating to those systems or produced out of those systems. But revising, uh, as you know, uh, revising record schedules can be a little bit of a drawn out process. So we wanted to create some quicker strategy that we hoped would provide some clarity and um, make the, G the existing GRS-20 a little bit more usable for folks. And so the interim strategy was to create a series of frequently asked questions or FAQs to provide that clarity. The, so that's the short-term strategy. The near-term strategy, not even really a long-term strategy, but the near-term strategy is um, <clears throat> that the GRS-20 is part of a five-year effort to restructure the entire GRS, and one of the GRSs we'll focus on in the first year is information and technology management, which obviously GRS-20 is part of. So that will take care of um, both short-term and, and near-term um, updates. So a little bit more background. There are several authorities in the mix. Um, that's what maybe complicates uh, GRS-20 and understanding how to use it a little bit. 
CRS-20 deals with electronic records, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about specifics uh, in a few slides. CRS-24 actually talks about information technology operations and management records. So related, but a little bit different. And then there are a couple of 36 CFRs, Codes of Federal Regulations, that are applicable here. 36 CFR 1225.22H talks about when records must be rescheduled, and that applies um, to records that are being converted to or used in another format in some cases. And 36 CFR 1225.24 um, addresses when uh, previously approved schedules can be applied to electronic records. So just keep those in mind, and you'll see those um, uh, citations or references again as we move into the, the meat of the FAQs. So the purpose of these uh, frequently asked questions or FAQs was to provide additional guidance on using GRS-20 uh, to schedule electronic systems, and specifically input records, which GRS-20 item 2 deals with, electronic records that replace hard copy records, which DRS-20 items 3 and 3.1 deal with, and output records, which DRS-20 items 4, 5, 6, 12, and 16 deal with. So you might ask yourself, what can you really do with DRS-20? Well, you can do a lot um, it, once it's possible to sort of make your way through the, um, the bog of uh, some of the more obscure language. But what GRS-20 allows you to do is to schedule, manage, and appropriately dispose of those input, source, input or source records, both hard copy and electronic, um, to schedule, manage, and appropriately dispose of electronic records, system master files. And these would be electronic records that replace hard copy or analog records, where the original hard copy records are scheduled as media neutral, as well as hard copy analog records where the original hard copy records are scheduled but not as media neutral. It also uh, allows you to schedule, manage, and dispose of output records, system documentation records, and system maintenance records. So that's a lot of volume is one way of thinking about it um, and, a, and a pretty wide scope as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is applying GRS-20 to those input or source records. And what you'll see uh, in a couple of slides are some pretty detailed tables. But before we get there, I want to define from the perspective of GRS-20 what those input or source records are. So these are sources of information in an electronic system, records used to create, update, or modify a master file when the master file is either is retained to meet record keeping requirements and is covered by an already existing NARA approved schedule. And these may be electronic files or hard copy documents. So keep that in mind because I think sometimes when, when we think about GRS-20, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that a large part of what GRS-20 addresses really is uh, uh, hard copy records, analog records. So as I said, this is uh, where we really begin to get into what the FAQ itself looks like. So we're looking at tables. And the goal when we started out was to try and create almost an if-then table, something that would be um, uh, easy to follow, where you would have a situation. So you would look at it and say, well, if the situation is this, then I do that. And I think we come close to that. but. But GRS-20 is pretty complicated. So in some cases, these tables have um, a series of columns. So you have to sort of step through them. And that's what I'll do fairly quickly in the time we have here. So we're talking first about input records that are in hard copy format. And you'll see that the first column is a description of the input record itself. In this uh, particular case, for these types of records, we try to provide some examples. And that's what those are. They're examples. They're not. They're not um, finite definitions, but just simply examples of what these types of records might be. And then the, the question to ask, is the source record already scheduled? Are there any limitations imposed by the GRS? And then we give you instructions on what to do and the actual GRS citation that authorizes you to do whatever that instruction is. So on this first page of the table, we're talking about hard copy records entered or scanned into the system where the electronic version captures all of the information on the hard copy. 
So hard copy records entered or scanned into a system where the electronic version captures all of the information from the hard copy. So examples might be data entered uh, into a system from a paper form or actual scanned images or, or PDF uh, versions of hard copy records. So then the question becomes, is the source record or input record already scheduled? And if the answer is yes and it's scheduled as permanent, scheduled as permanent, then we look at some limitations that might be imposed by the GRS. If the, if the already approved schedule says that the records must be transferred in hard copy, then the records must be transferred in hard copy. And so the instruction there is to apply the existing disposition authority for the source record, transfer the uh, hard copy records, uh, and GRS 20 item 2A1 is the authority for that. Another limitation to, um, uh, to ask yourself is whether the electronic version fails to meet NARA's transfer standards for electronic permanent records. And if that's the case, you again must apply the existing disposition authority for the source record. The RS-20 item 2A2 is the, is the disposition authority there. And then another limitation would be whether the schedule simply does not require hard copy transfer or is silent on the format of the records to be transferred to NARA. And if the electronic format meets NARA's transfer standards for electronic records, then you have the option uh, to destroy the, the input source records 60 days after you've notified NARA that the e-system is replacing the hard copy records that have already been scheduled as permanent and after you have verified that the electronic version uh, uh, is accurate, is an accurate representation, um, so that after the conversion has, uh, the information has been converted and verified, and after it's no longer needed for any legal or audit purposes on the part of your agency, or to support the reconstruction or to serve as a backup to the electronic records. So, that remains a fairly complicated mix to sort through, but the, but the real crux of that is that if the schedule does not require that the hard copy records themselves be transferred or doesn't speak to the format at all, and if your electronic version of these previously hard copy input records meet NARA's transfer standards, then you've got a notification requirement but you can destroy the original hard copy records once you've verified that the electronic version is, uh, is an accurate representation. And GRS 20, item 2A4, is the disposition authority there. So continuing on, other types of input records in hard copy format. If you've got hard copy records entered or scanned into the system where the electronic version, again, captures all information on the hard copy, but they're scheduled as temporary, then we're not um, looking at any uh, limitations that are imposed by the GRS. So these are hard copy records that capture all of the information um, once they're converted to electronic form, scheduled as temporary. Then the instruction per GRS 20, item 2A4, is to destroy the hard copy input or source records after the information has been converted to electronic form and verified. And again, when no longer needed for legal or audit purposes or to support reconstruction of or serve as a backup to the electronic records. So that's temporary records already scheduled. And then another um, uh, situation that you may encounter uh, and, and often do is that the source records themselves may not be scheduled, may never have been scheduled. And if that's the case, then it's simply a matter of um, the, the fact is that those input records themselves must be scheduled. So conversion to electronic is, a, is uh, not really a factor there. The input records themselves need to be scheduled. More uh, uh, situations of input records in hard copy format. So we're still talking about input records. In this case, hard copy records converted to electronic format in which, uh, it, it, but in this case, the, all of the information is not captured in the electronic version. And so some examples of that might be records with handwritten annotations that uh, either that through the conversion process, whatever it might be, scanning um, or uh, data entry, those handwritten annotations are not captured, um, simply uh, 
uh, not don't appear or illegible, whatever the case may be. So that's one example. Um, another example might be records with layered attached notes, and not all of those are captured, or color-dependent documents that are captured electronically, um, but only in black and white, or um, in, in such a way that the color-coded information fails to come through. So those are some examples of that type of input record uh, where the electronic version fails to capture all of the information on the hard copy version. So again, you're going to ask yourself whether the source record, the hard copy record, is already scheduled. If the answer is yes, um, then you apply the existing disposition authority to the source record and dispose of it uh, per those uh, uh, existing disposition instructions. If the answer is no, the input uh, or source record is not already scheduled, then again, the input record itself must be scheduled. Another uh, type of input record would be hard copy records where the electronic version does not replace the source record. And this might be um, a case where you have a case tracking system in which users input information from the source documents, but the documents themselves remain a distinct entity outside the system. Again, you're asking yourself, the, the first question is, are the, is the source record, are the source records themselves already scheduled? If the answer is yes, then apply the existing disposition authority for the source records. If the answer is no, then you have to undertake the SF-115 process to get the input or source record itself scheduled. Susan? Yes. I wanted to, to just pause you very quickly. Looks like we have a question from Victor in the chat. Okay. Would GRS-20 item 2A4 apply to civilian personnel records that have been scanned into EOPS? You know, I, that's something that we're taking under consideration, and my my preference would be if uh, Victor could put that question, and we'll talk about this at the very end, pose that question in an email to our GRS team email address, then we can take that uh, as a team under consideration and get back to him directly. And those kinds of questions may also um, become the source of further um, uh, revisions to the FAQs or just general guidance that we put out related to, in this case, uh, DRS-1 uh, types of records. Does that work? OK, thanks. All right, so let me start back into here. All right, so now we're talking about input records in electronic format. And the first type of um, electronic format input record that we look at are those electronic records used to create or update a master file. And examples of those would be work files, valid transaction files, intermediate input or output records. And there really are no limitations um, uh, imposed by GRS 20 relating to these types of uh, electronic input records. So the instructions are to delete after information has been transferred to the master file and verified. And the GRS authority for that is GRS 20, item 1B. The next type of input record are electronic records entered into a system during an update process. These uh, examples would be copies of data files or records from another system maintained by the agency itself. Limitations here might be that the electronic records, the electronic source records um, from, say, from another system are, are in and of themselves uh, required to be retained for legal or audit purposes. If that's the case, then those uh, input records have to be scheduled. If they're not required for legal or audit purposes, then they can be deleted after the electronic version is verified or when no longer needed as a backup. And GRS 20, item 2B, is the disposition authority there. And yet another kind of electronic input record are electronic records received from another agency and used as input or source records. And I think we, we see this increasingly um, as agencies uh, uh, share information and actually have electronic systems uh, created for uh, internal agency purposes, mission-related purposes, that at some point in their life cycle feed into 
the system of another agency, uh, a, a completely different agency. And so um, without coming up with some real specific agency examples, but you can imagine that um, FAA might maintain information on uh, bird strike uh, hazards around uh, airports, and they might share that information with the military who uh, maybe has uh, uh, air wings or squadrons uh, co-located at some joint use facilities, that kind of thing. So, um, but there are probably many, many examples, um, certainly in the natural resource management arena. Um, so an example, just generically, would be copies of data files or records from a system in another agency. And some of the limitations that are imposed within the GRS are that if the, um, if the data files uh, or records from the other agency, the creating agency, are produced under an interagency agreement or created for specific information needs of the receiving agency, then those records need to be scheduled. Those input uh, records need to be scheduled. If they're neither produced under an interagency agreement nor created for specific information agency needs of the receiving agency, then they can be destroyed after the electronic version is verified or when no longer needed for legal or audit purposes. And so those, those are some um, uh, examples there. And then finally, just a couple more of uh, input records in electronic format. Um, another type are uncalibrated and unvalidated data collected in observation or measurement activities or research and development programs. So examples would be scientific observational data, say, from satellites or research experimental test data. And the instruction from GRS-20 is to delete after the necessary data have been incorporated into the master file. And so the thing to remember here is that we're talking about, uh, on all three of these slides, uh, we've been talking about electronic uh, records, electronic files that are the input or source files feeding into an electronic system. So the, the vocabulary of the nomenclature can even here get kind of confusing, I think. Um, but at any rate, these would be, uh, uh, would be appropriate, and your instruction is to delete after the necessary data has been incorporated into the master file, and the GRS authority is 20, item 2D. And then finally, electronic records that are scheduled elsewhere, and the system that the input or source records are feeding into does not replace the source record. An example here would be a case tracking system in which users input information from the source records into a, an electronic system, but the records themselves remain a distinct entity outside the system. And in that case, you simply apply the, the source system's existing disposition authority, if there is one, or schedule the source system if it's unscheduled. And so those are input records in both hard copy or analog format and input records in electronic format. So there's uh, quite, a, quite a long list of the different types of input or source records that it's possible to encounter as you go about uh, using the GRS to, to manage uh, and ultimately dispose of these records. And I did want to add one, one note, and that is that electronic files created specifically from one system as input to another system must either be covered by the GRS or separately scheduled, even if the originating system is already scheduled. So keep that in mind. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the um, electronic records or system master files themselves. And in most cases, I think we, we are anymore really looking at system, uh, electronic systems when we're talking about using the GRS 20. So again, some definitions. What are electronic records or system master files? This, in this case, we're talking about the actual content of the system or the electronic record series. And that may consist of data. It may consist of scanned text. It may consist of PDF files or digital images or some other form of electronic information, um, possibly other forms of electronic information that we haven't even identified yet. Um, and it may include information content of the entire system or content of a group or related files. 
Um, the related records in a single master file are not always in the same format, and that's something that, you, that you'll see, for instance, in geographic information system, um, which may have um, uh, the geographic uh, GIS layers themselves, but the system may include other kinds of uh, electronic records um, uh, as well, uh, scanned uh, documents, scanned images, those kinds of things. So keep that in mind. And then we have the table. Um, and this one looks a little bit different. So we're going to talk about whether the records are temporary or permanent first in this case, and then give a description of a rec the record, um, some conditions that might apply, and then answer the question of whether um, a new schedule is required, and then the GRS uh, or CFR citation. And this is the case where those uh, CFRs that I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation really do come into play. So we're talking about master files that replace hard copy or analog records where the original hard copy analog records are scheduled as media neutral. So these are, uh, if, if, these are, if the originals are scheduled as media neutral, either directly or because of the date of the schedule, um, that's what we're talking about here. So then, if we're talking about um, master files um, that replace hard copy analog records, where if we're talking about original hard copy or analog records that are temporary, um, and these might be program records approved for destruction in a previously approved schedule, um, and the schedule is media neutral and does not explicitly exclude electronic records, then no new schedule is required. You simply apply the existing schedule. So for temporary records where the schedule is, uh, where there's an approved schedule in place for the originals and the schedule is media neutral, then no new schedule is required. If the disposition of the original hard copy records are permanent, is permanent, um, and so these are electronic records that replace permanent hard copy records. Um, and the, ele the electronic records uh, meet NARA standards for permanent records. Then no new schedule is required, but there is a notification requirement. In this case, agencies must notify NARA within 90 days of when the electronic record keeping system becomes operational. And there is an exception. Notification is not required if the records are already, are already being transferred to the National Archives as electronic records or are maintained electronically when the media neutral schedule item that covers them was approved by NARA. But so in general, if you've got permanent records, permanent um, electronic records that replace permanent hard copy records, then the electronic record and the electronic records meet NARA standards for permanent records. Um, no new schedule is required, but there is a notification requirement. <coughs> if the records do not meet NARA standards for transferring permanent records, then a new schedule is required. And GRS 20 item 3.1 is the disposition authority there. So then we have master files that replace hard copy or analog records where the original hard copy analog records are already scheduled, but were not scheduled as media neutral uh, for whatever reason, either because of the date, the, um, the date of the uh, schedule, it may be an older schedule, um, or that kind of thing. Um, and so just a little caveat here, a schedule is only media neutral if it, one, specifically states that it is, uh, that it is media neutral or that it applies to records in all formats, or two, if it was submitted to NARA after December 17th 2007 and, and approved is the given there and is not explicitly limited to a single medium. So there's your definition of what constitutes a media neutral schedule and what does not. So in this case, if we're talking about permanent records, permanent original hard copy or analog records, um, so any digital record previously scheduled in hard copy or analog format is permanent. If the, if the electronic records that you're converting to meet NARA standards for transfer of permanent records, then a new schedule is not required. But again, that notification requirement exists. So agencies must notify NARA within 90 days of when the replacement electronic record keeping system becomes operational. 
if the if the um, electronic um, system or electronic records don't meet NARS transfer requirements for permanent records, then a new schedule is required. And again, the disposition authority is simply GRS 20, item 3.1. And then another little uh, addition to be aware of, if an electronic system replaces hard copy records that were never scheduled, then both versions, the hard copy, the original hard copy, and the electronic system that's re that, that the agency wants to replace them with, must be retained until the electronic records are scheduled. And new electronic systems that do not replace already scheduled hard copy records must also be scheduled. That's, that's an of course. Okay. So switching gears yet again, master files that replace hard copy analog records where the original hard copy analog records are scheduled but not as media neutral. So in this case, the disposition of the original is temporary. Um, and you might have several uh, different examples here. They might be scanned images, audiovisual records, data relating to administrative or housekeeping records covered by the GRS or an agency schedule, program records, records containing information from both administrative or housekeeping functions, and then program records in a single data record. So let's look at scanned images first. So these are temporary scanned images for the original hard copy. Um, we're talking about temporary uh, scanned images. There are no conditions uh, in the GRS, and no new schedule is required. So if you've got audiovisual records, there are no conditions that apply, and no new schedule is required. If you are um, talking about master files replacing hard copy analog records, where the original hard copy records are scheduled but not as media neutral, and the original is temporary, and the records consist of data relating to administrative or housekeeping uh, types of records covered by the GRS or an existing agency schedule, then the records are not subject to the GRS with some exceptions. And those accepted records would be GRS 1, item 21, GRS 1, item 22, GRS 1, item 25F, GRS 12, item 3, and GRS 18, item 5. Um, if the records are not subject to these very specific uh, exceptions, then no new schedule is required. However, if they are, if they do fall within one of these accepted categories, then it is, uh, a new schedule is required to be submitted. Then in the category of program records, it's pretty straightforward. A new schedule is going to be required. And for records that contain a hybrid mix of administrative and program records, then a new schedule is also going to be required. So one of the ways that I approach looking at um, these tables that get pretty complex, uh, not as complex as the narrative form of GRS 20 itself, we hope, but nonetheless, you have to sort of um, work through these tables. And part of the way um, we do that is always keeping in mind what that overarching title is. So if we're talking about master files that replace hard copy records, where the original hard copy uh, records were, are scheduled, but were not scheduled as media neutral. And then we're talking about originals that were temporary, and the records are scanned images. The records are audiovisual records. You have to just step through it um, and, and find the correct category for the type of record that you're dealing with, and then um, step through the individual columns to see whether it's something that's going to require a new schedule or not. Okay. And so the third category uh, that the GRS-20 uh, applies to are output records. And so what are output records? Well, we all have a pretty good idea of what output records are, but just for definition's sake, what we're talking about are records derived from the system master file. So for example, a report that agency staff print out from the system itself. They may be electronic or hard copy. And reports produced using system information but not created directly from within the system itself are not system output records. So for example, annual reports that are prepared by looking at information contained within the system, by analyzing information, um, even maybe by extracting little snippets of information, those are not necessarily output reports. It's really reports that are derived from the system master file 
Um, so it's a function that the system itself provides. And here's the table. So we have the description of records, in some cases some examples, uh, disposition instructions, records excluded from coverage, and then the GRS citation. So in the first uh, uh, category here of electronic system output records, uh, that would be data files created by summarizing or aggregating information from a single master file or database scheduled as temporary on an R approved schedule or disposable under an existing GRS item. And so an example would be data pulled from uh, queries to produce a report out of a system. And the disposition instructions here are that these are temporary, can be deleted when the agency determines the data files are no longer needed for administrative, legal, audit, or other operational purposes. Keep in mind we're talking about the output record here. Temporary delete when the agency determines it's essentially no longer needed. Um, there are some uh, records that would be excluded from uh, coverage here, and the categories of exclusion are if the originating master file was scheduled prior to January 1, 1988, if the outputs were created as disclosure-free files to allow public access to the information, or if the originating master file was scheduled as permanent, but the originating master file itself is no longer accessible or no longer exists. In that case, um, the, the temporary and uh, delete instructions would not apply. Another category of records, electronic system output records, are data files created by extracting records from a single master file or database scheduled as temporary on a NAR approved uh, schedule or disposable under a GRS, this GRS item. And again, the disposition instructions are to uh, delete when the agency determines the data files are no longer needed for administrative, legal, audit, or other operational purposes. And many of the same um, uh, exclusions apply if the outputs were created as disclosure-free files to allow public access or if the extraction process actually changes the informational content of the originating master file, or if the originating master file was scheduled as permanent but no longer accessible. And then several other types of electronic system output records, uh, data files extracted from a master file or database without changing it and used solely to produce hard copy publications or printouts of tabulations, ledgers, registers, and statistical reports electronic queries or ad hoc reports, uh, electronic queries or reports published on the web from administrative housekeeping systems. And I'm going to just quickly uh, run through these. We've, we've provided some examples. The one thing I would point out for the data files extracted from a master file or database without changing it, um, these are primarily print files. Typically, they were created in the mainframe environment. Not so much anymore, but there may still be instances where you'll see them. And because it's uh, represented in the GRS-20, we've included it here in the, in the FAQ. Um, electronic queries are ad hoc reports. These would be routine system queries, um, not necessarily printed out. Routine reports that are generated and viewed in electronic format uh, within the system itself, those kinds of things. Um, and all of these are handled as temporary, uh, can be deleted when the agency determines they're no longer needed for whatever administrative, legal, audit, or other purpose they were generated for in the first place. And then finally, queries or reports that are printed out to meet ad hoc business needs. Again, these are temporary, can be destroyed when the agency determines that the printouts are no longer needed, um, or these are printouts in this case that may you may uh, opt to file with the appropriate related series. So if you're printing out reports to meet ad hoc business needs, it may very well be that the reports themselves can become larger, a part of a larger case file, for example, and filing them uh, with that uh, other record series is perfectly, apt, is perfectly suitable. Uh, in that case, they would be disposed of in accordance with the approved schedule for the series that they're filed with. Okay. And then finally, applying GRS-20 to system documentation records. So uh, the definition part of this, system documentation records consist of data system specifications, file specifications, code books, record layouts, user guides, output specifications, the kind of documentation uh, about the system itself and how to use the system, 
um, those kinds of things. But these are not records relating to the actual development of the system. So records relating to the development of the system are not system documentation records and are more likely to be found uh, and covered under GRS 24. And really, we're just talking about two types, uh, system documentation for temporary systems and system documentation for permanent systems. And if it's uh, system documentation for a temporary system, the uh, GRS citation and disposition instruction is GRS 20, item 11A1. The, the documentation records themselves are temporary and can be destroyed or deleted upon authorized deletion of the related electronic records or system or upon destruction of the output of the system if the output is needed to protect legal rights, whichever is later. And if the system documentation relates to permanent system, then the disposition authority is GRS 20, item 11A2, and the documentation records themselves are also permanent. The system documentation records themselves are also permanent, and they are to be transferred to the National Archives with the permanent electronic records or system to which the documentation relates. One thing to be aware of as we are uh, rapidly uh, engaging with and moving into the electronic records archives world, if the records are being transferred via the electronic records archives, then the instruction is not to use the GRS item, this GRS item, to transfer the documentation, but use the disposition authority for the master files themselves, because we don't want we want them to come in as a package. We don't want them being transferred under two separate disposition authorities. So, if you're transferring a permanent electronic system to the National Archives via ERA, transfer the documentation under the disposition authority um, that applies to the electronic system itself that you're transferring. And then there are system maintenance records. Um, and these are pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Um, but we're talking about um, several types of system maintenance records. There are records relating to system performance testing. So these are electronic files or records created solely to test system performance, as well as hard copy printouts and related documentation for the electronic files or records, but all of it related to system performance testing. These are temporary records that can be deleted or destroyed when your agency determines they're no longer needed for administrative, legal audit, or other operational purposes. Then you might have records relating to system usage. So these would be electronic files and hard copy printouts created to monitor system usage, including but not limited to things like login files, password files, audit trail files, actual system usage files, cost back files used to assess charges um, back to individual users or departments for their actual system use, those kinds of things. These two are temporary um, uh, and may be deleted or destroyed once the agencies determine they're no longer needed. Backup files of permanent electronic records, these are temporary. Um, these can be deleted when the identical records have been captured in the subsequent backup file or when the identical records have been transferred to the National Archives and successfully copied. Backup files of temporary electronic records can be deleted when the identi identical records have been deleted themselves or replaced by a subsequent backup file. Additional system maintenance records include special purpose programs, um, application software necessary solely to use or maintain a master file or database that's authorized for disposal in a GRS item or a NAR approved uh, record schedule excluding special purpose software necessary to use or maintain any unscheduled master file or database or any master file or database scheduled for transfer to the National Archives. These are temporary and can be deleted when the related master file or database has been deleted. So these are special purpose programs. And then finally, user identification, profiles, authorizations, and password files, uh, routine systems, four routine systems. Um, and these would be those that are not covered under GRS 24 item 8A. Um, and it excludes, specifically excludes, records relating to electronic signatures. And these are temporary as well, can be deleted or destroyed when your agency determines they're no longer needed. And so that's the FAQs really quickly. Um, if you had a chance at this point to take a look at the FAQs themselves, they've been out for about a month. Um, 
there was a memo to uh, agency uh, records officers that came out about a month ago announcing that the FAQs had been issued. You can find these FAQs. And, and as I said, the FAQs really are these tables. Um, they look a little bit different, not nearly as colorful, for one thing, um, and no, no graphics. But essentially, these are, the FAQs are these tables. You'll find them online in two different places. And the URLs are up here. Um, for your information and, and, uh, and in the handouts that came along with this presentation. And then GRS 20, Electronic Records, is itself, of course, available on the NARA website at the URL here at the bottom, http www.archives.gov, records management, GRS, GRS 20.html. So you've got that information. And then I wanted to provide you with some contact information. As I mentioned, we're attempting to capture all of the questions and comments and suggestions relating to any GRS item, but in this case, we'll focus specifically on GRS 20, um, by uh, asking folks to email us at the GRS team at nara.gov email address. And that way, we've got a, a sort of a written record of the question and our response, if that's what's coming in, or the comment or suggestion. Um, and that will feed into a number of things, possibly the revision of these GRS 20 FAQs, um, issuance of further guidance related to other GRS, and will certainly help inform and improve, uh, will be one avenue for informing and improving our efforts at restructuring the GRS. Um, which begin uh, here uh, October 1st, have begun already, but really begin um, full tilt uh, with the fiscal year 13. So that's one, uh, one interactive way of, uh, of getting information, getting questions answered, making suggestions. And another source of information is the Records Express blog, which is uh, at http uh, blogs.archives.gov uh, backslash records express. So those are two online-based uh, sources for you. And then I just wanted to mention who actually is on the GRS team. So it's not the same as attaching faces to names, but at least you can attach names and email addresses to the GRS team. Andrea Riley is our team lead. She is uh, located in Nebraska. One of the things that will become clear as I run through this list real quick is that we are very much a virtual team. We're located all across the country. So Andrea is in Nebraska. Jenny Gibo is in College Park. Laura McHale is in New York. I am in Anchorage, Alaska, as I said. Leslie is back in College Park. And Galen Wilson is in Ohio. And some of you may know one or more of the team members already. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us individually, but we really do want um, to encourage the use of the GRS team at nara.gov email address for more formal um, communications, formal just meaning that it's something that the entire GRS team should be aware of. So that's contacts and information. And with that, we'll stop and take questions. Okay. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan, for that great presentation. We learned a lot. It looks like we do have one question down here. This is from Lenny. And it says, will the restructured GRS address specific system uh, address specific systems based on functional areas, or will the GRS 20 approach be available as a way of scheduling electronic records? I think the latter. The, the way we're approaching the restructuring effort is to attempt to restructure the, the entire GRS. Not, not, we're not talking about GRS 20 here, but the entire GRS along functional business lines lines of business, those kinds of concepts, um, rather than, you know, I, what's happened over the years with the GRS is that, um, although you could argue that a lot of it is functionally based now, some things have crept in that are really format based. And in a way, that's what GRS 20 is. There are a couple of other GRSs that are really very format based. Um, and that's not, to the, to the extent that we can, that's not the approach we want to take. So I think um, the latter, the, the GRS itself will be restructured along functional 
uh, areas and lines of business. Um, and then in general, if you're talking about um, systems, uh, you, GRS-20 or something like GRS-20 will still be out there as a tool. Um, we w I don't envision undertaking to schedule specific types of electronic systems in different GRSs. So I don't think we're talking about um, necessarily scheduling uh, uh, electronic travel systems in and of themselves, because we really want to schedule the function. We hope you found this seminar useful. For more information about the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration and its National Records Management Training Program, please visit us online at archives.gov or view our current schedule of face-to-face -face and online workshops at nara.learn.com.